Well, hello there. Welcome to Alice in Wonderland. Thank you for joining us this fine evening. Uh, I'm very excited that you are here because tonight I get to introduce you to the one, the only, Rick Zeef. Rick Zeef is an amazing Emmy-nominated voice actor as well as a voice director and casting director. He's been working in the animation business for over 25 years, and he is one cool dude. Uh, Rick is probably one of my favorite actors to do the voice acting thing with, and um, we're going to have him live on the show. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Hey, voice chasers. Hey, Tyler Dog. Good to see you again. Um, yes, for anybody, we're just waiting for um, Rick to tune in. He'll be here just momentarily. Hey, James, it's good to see you. Is everybody having a good week? Jeff, it wouldn't be Allison's Wonderland without you. Thank you for tuning in. Hey, Real Magic TV, thank you for tuning in. Hey, Melissa, it's good to see you as well. Um, go Patriots. I didn't check the score. I don't think we, I think we won. Um, but yeah, let me just double check with Rick that he has um, the right information because I don't see him on the screen right now. So, so bear with me one minute. You guys missed my little masterpiece theater intro that I tried to do from my from my memory. Um, yes, thanks for bearing with me. Um, how's everybody doing today? You love my hair? I think I got a haircut. Don't worry. I wore a mask. Um, so yeah, a little bit more about Rick. Um, Rick and I met working on a show called The Mr. Men Show, which was my very first animated series that I did in 2008. And uh, Rick was at Renegade Animation, and here he is. And um, Rick uh, is going to tell you all about it. So hold on, let me go ahead and add him to the stream. Press to join in them. You can go ahead and accept it. Hi. Wow, that's really close up. I did say it, but it does come in very close for some reason. You get your angles, and then it's like, whoa, hey, I'm back. Yeah. The microphone. Wow, I'll go back here. How are you? I'm great. Hey, James Harrow, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. Art is also from New England. Um, my friend Ghetto Fabulous, who's on the stream, is also from New England. And fun fact, Rick Seif, where are you from? I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. Yay! Yes. Little known fact. I've been working hard to hide the accent, and now I get these jobs where they want a Boston accent, and I get very confused. Hmm. But I'm, uh, I'm from the suburbs of Boston. What part? What part? Well, I grew up in Natick. Natick. Out near Framingham. Yeah. You know, where sometimes it gets wicked hot in the summer. Of course. You know, it's impossible to park anywhere. Um, yeah, Framingham, Natick, and then we moved to, like, closer to Boston, to a town called Weston, the very tiny little pilgrimy town. Yes, Rick Zeef, voice of reason, says actor Will Roberts. <laughs> hey, hey, thanks, actor Will Roberts. Have Glad you're on board. Tonight. <laughs> you know, you yeah. know, I grew up in Massachusetts, too. I grew up in Hanson, a small town called Hanson. I know. Hanson, is that a little further out west? Uh, it's south. It's in Plymouth South. County. Oh, Plymouth County. Okay, yeah. near Buzzards Bay in that area. Yeah, you know, Buzzards Bay is a little bit farther, but, you know, we'll take it. <laughs> Be happy for that. Wow. Better than I'll Can you, can, first of all, can you hear me okay? I'm, I'm not the Mr. Technological guy. Can you hear me? You want me to goose up anything? I hear you great, and I see you great. Wow. wow. You look yeah, great. A, Are this you is extreme close-up. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, this is a booth, mm -hmm. and I was sitting in front of a booth because I thought a solid background um, would, uh, you know, make me look really thin. I, I don't know. I don't know why. I, I'm just here. There's a light, tiny. and my, my uh, tripod was here, so I was very proud of myself. It kind of looks like you created a green screen from your beard. That's what. It, that's the whole look. It yep. all goes my face really starts here. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Movember. Will you be celebrating Movember? Uh, I kind of always do, you know? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I've had this beard since, you know, a long, long time ago. I love this. I see hearts fluttering. Yes. Uh, people are saying hi. This Hope is very Levy exciting. Is on another voice actress is on. The oh, show. yeah. She's no gonna be coming on the show in the next couple months, hopefully. I'm gonna wipe my lens so you can see me. Is that where my lens is? Can you see me? We I don't know where my lens. Yeah. This is. I have to wipe my face. There you go. <laughs> got my 
shout out for Batman. This is my Batman lens cloth cleaner. Hey, did you do some Batman stuff? I did um, a really fun job. Uh, yes, Adam West's last job. It was a pinball, not a video game, but a uh, video game. Uh, a pinball old school for the 60th anniversary of the real Batman. We got the real Batman, the real Robin. And if you remember the old wow. Batman series from those old days, there was always this kind of goofy announcer narrator guy. And I um, apparently sound somewhat like him. And it was just really fun. And um, I was there for the swag. I got a Batman jacket and the Batman lens cloth. So that's my favorite. Wow. Swag is always the cool stuff Don't we love like the dolls and the mugs, like pay me what you can, but give me a mug or a pencil. I know you can like see my like Mr. Men wow. slash Yokai Watch collection over there in the corner. So I totally hear you. I have candy nice. from like you know six years ago that I won't allow my child to open. <laughs> and so she's always like, "Can I take this out of the box?" And like, no, absolutely not. No way. That's so awesome. Oh, we love have some the merch. Jerry fans on the show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Love that. Couple fans. So, uh, Rick, we know that you are um, an Emmy-nominated voice actor, which, you know, I got to say, especially considering um, there's not multiple awards for voice acting. At the They give out one, and you can right. be nominated. It's not, there's not separate categories for men and women. There's just, is it three? No. Or five? It's five. Five, right? It was five, yeah. And I, I was staggered and, and so surprised. It was both men and women. And it was, you yeah. know, um, let's just say very, you know, it was like Kelsey Grammer, Kate McKinnon. It was like all these celebrities. And at the very bottom, there's this this other dude. And it was, uh, it was very awesome and exciting. Oh, um, I think they should separate categories. But anyway, it was, it was Cinderella time to be able to, you know, put on a tux and, and, and meet people and have a blah. Just a big honor for me. So I'm thrilled. Who did you go with? Did you take your wife? I took my wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my wife and I took lots of pictures and hung out there. And uh, uh, it was just exciting. It's funny. Um, you know, I'm the biggest hypocrite. Like, growing up as a young actor, you know, you'd watch the Tonys, you'd watch the Oscars. And part of you wants to be up on that stage someday. But I'd, I'd always be like, it's all about the work, you know. <laughs> I have my own trophy in my own heart, you know. I don't need a trophy room. <laughs> and then as soon as you get the, you know, nomination, it's like they're still on the phone and I'm getting the tux fitting and I'm like, Mr. Hypocrite, how many parties can I say yes to? Yes. So um, I'm a big phony. It was fun. Um, but, you know, it is it is truly about the work. Being recognized is, is great. But I think being actors, as you and I have been for a long time, me a lot longer, but... Um, it is about the work, but we do love a little bit of feedback. You know, sometimes you feel like you're in a vacuum and uh, that polite nod that my work was worthy uh, was very exciting. Yay, that's amazing. <laughs> um, did you care to do Spike? Sorry. Hey, He's got that. Could you hear me at all? I'm maybe very loud. He's yeah, a very loud voice. You. Every engineer says, please move to the other room. You know, move away from the microphone. But Allison, I'm so glad to be here to talk to all your fans out there. He's just talking like this. That's, that's Spike. Oh, that's so fun. And you did, uh, you, you've done some other characters on the show as well, right? Yeah, you know, they reach out whenever there's a, a new or an ancillary character, they throw them at me, the French guy, the this guy, the nerdy guy, the hotel, whatever, whenever there's an episode and I'm, I'm in it, or sometimes even if I'm not in it as Spike, they will throw some fun stuff at me. It's, it's been a great ride. We're in our sixth season and it's just one of those insane gifts. You know, you hope that something can last a season. You hope yeah. you can get a few episodes. Um, or when you're a guest on a show, you think, oh, could he come back? There's no toe tag on him. He might still be alive. Um, and you think maybe he'll come back for another episode. And I literally have been so lucky uh, to do episodes. You too have been part of the show for a long time and have done a good chunk of episodes. So having a character that starts to fit you like an old glove is mm -hmm. just, it's so great to just see how the characters grow and develop in different circumstances. Um, and of course the people that we work with, um, it's renegade through Warner Brothers that are just so warm and so amazing. And um, it's, it's a great, it's a, the best job I've ever had that particular Aww. one. 
That's you know? amazing. It's one of the many greatest jobs I've ever had. I guess I want to be inclusive of every job that anytime someone said, you're the guy, uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative. Yeah. Yeah. It's like asking about which is your favorite child. That's right. Although in That's our cases, right. we both only have one child, so it's very clear <laughs> right. which one. And she is, she is neck and neck for my favorite, my child. So, no. <laughs> you know, actually, so I don't know if our, our viewers know, but your daughter is actually a voice actress as well. I have to give a shout out to my daughter, Katie Zeef, who uh, has been doing voiceovers since before she could even read. <laughs> um, I used to have to go into the booth with her and say the line to her so she would know what the line is and then she would say it. Um, she um, got to do a, a really adorable series uh, with, called Little Angels. It was little brother and sister. <clears throat> and she did um, just a fabulous job. She was maybe six years old. Um, and that actually came about, funny story. Um, I was working on a show um, on Nickelodeon called um, Olivia, based on the book series uh, of the little pig character of Olivia yeah. and I and I got to play the dad character and my daughter okay. and wife bless you Thank came you. by to um, just kind of observe the session they let them watch and hang out and at the end I said would you mind if I just took a picture of my daughter in the booth with the big headphones because her head's like this big and the headphones were this big and um, we put her in there she looked all adorable and she put on these <laughs> huge headphones and uh, I said to the director, just have her say something. I'm going to videotape her saying something. And she said something painfully cute. And the director said, have her say this. And have her improvise about her favorite crayon colors or whatever. And she goes off. And my kid is very funny and as outspoken as I am. And the next thing you know, she was one of the school kids in Olivia. And because of that, uh, one of those same writers was writing this other show for Little Angels, and she got to play the lead in the series at quite a young age and has stayed with it uh, all the way through. Uh, she was a recurring role on Sophia the First as a little oh. British sorceress, and she got to sing songs. Just about two weeks ago, it was Halloween time, and one of the songs she sang was a special Halloween episode song. And just for fun, we went on to Google or Spotify to see how many times it had been listened to or downloaded. She was like, Dad, my song's been listened to a half a million times. And I'm like, I'm coming to you for work. Are you kidding? What? That's amazing. <laughs> Where is Miss Katie now? Miss Katie's in the next room, probably doing homework or hiding from this whole oh, event of Dad being like, like, like. Drag her on and be like, here's a cameo, Katie. <laughs> she, she would have to go through the works first, I think. Uh, <laughs> the hair and makeup trailers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're in we're in a gauntlet right now of my daughter's a high school senior and she is looking for colleges and doing all her essays and deadlines and it's a it's a pretty crazy time around here it's a, t it's and, a tough time to do that too because you can't actually visit the schools can you no they're all virtual tourists mm -hmm. we've we've toured many 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 schools and um interviewed with some admissions people and she's looking at acting programs on on all in all areas and she's very open to different cities and, and different programs and it's exciting it's um i know with your little one you feel like oh time's going so quickly <laughs> you know you'll blink and you'll be doing this college thing saying wait a minute you know it's it's wild it's really yeah, wild but. i know well the first few years go uh excruciatingly slow and uh, i'm just <laughs> like why do people say this flies by this is torturously slow um why can't you eat solid food and then um yeah and then i think around three it really has sped up and um now yeah. he's so cute i'm like donate another day yay that's um, great a lot of people asking what your inspiration was for spike how you were able to do the voice of spike so i know you just did the voice for us but can you talk a little bit yeah. about you know you got the audition how did that all come about well it, it's interesting because i, I think as actors, we gravitate nat uh, naturally to originating role. Like when we, when you and I worked on the Mr. Men show, yeah. we, we weren't doing sound alike. So this was a, a new show that had very colorful characters. You're, you were so good on that show. I just want to give you the yeah. shout out. So amazing. And, um, uh, but it was curious with this sort of, you know, legacy character, if you will, mm -hmm. there were many who had done the role before. So the edict was to, 
honor that and listen to the old voices that were doing it and then sort of to put my spin on it. And um, I, my inspiration honestly was an imitation of an imitation for the most part. My dad was a big fan of Jimmy Durante, who was an actor back in the day. Mm -hmm. And he had that really kind of weird rhythm with, the, you know, mm -hmm. and my father loved to imitate that. And so I was doing an imitation of an imitation and that's, that's an homage for pop for the most part. That's interesting because I would say that your spike has a lot of heart to it. And I, I can see that it, it, it has this connection that moves you not just on a comic level, but on a, a, a <laughs> level of emotion. It's interesting that. I am so delighted that you somehow like would even pick that up. Here's why, you know, as written, he's this very gruff and, you know, I'm gonna give you a knuckle sandwich kind of guy. But um, I am like the biggest, you know, mushy family teddy bear kind of guy. Yeah. And um, I wanted to bring, I didn't know any better than to bring that heart to him, but I wanted him to have that heart. And um, there are episodes with his son, Tyke, that are my favorite because he is the most doting dad. Uh, in fact, um, one actor trick that a lot of us use is we have like a key phrase that we'll use to log us into the character, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes mm -hmm. uh, for your viewers who are actors, you know, if you do a cartoon, you better sound the same in episode 41 that you did in episode three. So staying consistent is a very, very important part of that game. Uh, and there may be long lapses of time. You might do a video game and, and part two of the video game where the sequel is three years later. So being able to be consistent is important. So for, for that and some of my characters, I very privately have key phrases mm -hmm. that I say that log me into not only the vocal essence of the character, but the emotional core of the character. And for Spike, and I won't share them all with you, but I'll share that one mm -hmm. with you. Um, I, I literally, it's two words. And my, for all of Spike and all of his anger and da, 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 this is my key phrase to log me into character. Taiki boy. Mm -hmm. That's it. Taiki boy. And, and the, the people, you know, at the studio get a kick out of it because every dozen lines or, or so, I'll lean away from Mike and just go, Taiki boy. So he's gruff, he's big, he's burly, but he's got a soft core and he is um, very loving. And I love, I mean, that, it, that you noticed it or felt it. I mean, that's a very important part of the character for me. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> um, do you remember the first time we ever met? <laughs> Do you remember the first time we ever met? Um, I would have said it was on the Mr. Men show and I'm guessing that's wrong. No, I, I'm pretty sure. I, I mean, I was curious because I, I have general memories of the first sessions that we had. Um, so yeah. for those at, um, that might not be familiar, there was a show called the Mr. Men show, which was on Cartoon <sighs> Network. We did two <sighs> seasons around 2008. And um, so it was the iconic characters. Actually, I can show you guys. Like Little it was Miss Sunshine great. and Little Miss Naughty and Little Miss Lips. <laughs> and Rick, who did you play? Which were your characters? Uh, I played Mr. Nervous, which still is one of my favorite characters of, of, that I've ever done. I just had such a ball. And I also played um, Mr. Nosy. Oh, so those are my two characters. Can you do uh, Mr. Nosy for us? Uh, Mr. Nosey, this kind of was very nasal. Mr. Nosey, he was always paired with Mr. Small. And Mr. <laughs> Small was like, Nose, we're going to do this. And I'm like, no, okay. He wasn't the Richard sharpest Epcar? nostril on the face. That was Phil Lawler, Phil Lawler. played Mr. Small. Yes. And he was like, Nose, we're going to do this. He had this sort of regal thing. Mm -hmm. And I was always the big, dumb kind of follower. I had a ball with that. Um, Mr. Nervous just has remained like a, a staple and a go-to he was just utterly nervous about everything and i i loved doing him a lot yeah that was so fun how did you end up um working on that show how did was that an audition you got through an agent or someone or i got that audition through my agent and the, another for anybody who's pursuing acting out there i know probably a lot of your followers are, are actors as well and yeah. stick with it stick with it um I had a very lengthy TV and film career before I went into animation yes. and people are surprised to find out how late in the game I was before I moved over to video games and animation. And- Party um, five, what, what? Yeah, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, party 
if I have a few. Um, someone IMD beat me. Um, so I, um, when the audition came, they listed all of the characters. And they said, audition for any one of these that you want. And, you know, I was so industrious and so driven um, that I think at the time, I want to say there were something like 17 male characters on the list. I don't know if they ultimately were all used, you know, because it was Mr. Nervous, Mr. You know, they probably had the, the ones that got pushed to the side, you know, Mr. Sloven, Slovenly, Mr. You know, Bacon. I don't know what they, what the offshoots were, but I did, I did all 17 characters with three varying takes for each one. I sent in 51 auditions. Is that the right math? Let's go with that. What, how long did that take you to? Like it was a whole weekend. I just, I locked myself away for like two and a half days wow. and I sent in a file, a very big file of all these characters and, and those, I was delighted to get those too. Um, and so, I don't know. I, I think that that enterprising spirit either completely turned them on or made them very frightened. I, I'm not sure. But I'll say it paid off. Or he's gonna it smell. paid off. And I, and I will say that I think that's where we did meet. Because I remember our first conversation. Somehow we came up with a Boston thing. You had just left. You were, came from Emerson. Yeah. And okay. you were fairly new. And we had this Boston connection. And, um, I, and then I remember one of the head writers was also a Boston person. And um, I think we had this whole Boston. Actually, yeah. Eric Casimiro. Eric is from... Eric is from um, a, a town very close to where I'm from, Marshfield, Massachusetts. Oh, oh Marshfield. And, wow. Uh, Kate's actually from Maine, but still New England. Wow. If New England. My New England peeps are still on this. this right. Thing. Well, we, we met there. And um, what was great, and, and I, I hope you'll agree with me, that the best part of the the doing of the show, the being in the show and character work is a blast, but doing it what we'll call radio play style, where we're in a booth with multiple actors at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you are not just acting, but you're reacting. You're actually playing whole scenes. Um, some of the people who are new to animation or not in the business might not realize for a lot of our shows, you go in, you read your lines and you leave. And then the next person reads their lines and later they, they lace them all together for dialogue. But we got to actually riff, and that was the best part. I know. I mean, you think about it. Yep, Jeff, the token New Yorker. You think about it, and um, it's not the most, it's not the least expensive way to do it because you're keeping everybody right. there for the same amount of time, and you need more microphones. Um, but you create this spontaneity that can't quite be, you know, otherwise, your director has to really have a good ear and know, oh, well, you know, try it like this or have a lot of options so that if somebody delivers their line differently, you have like a backup. Yes. Um, right. Can I give a quick shout out apropos to what we're talking about? Of course. Um, I, um, there's a new game launched. It's called Bug Snacks, B-U-G-S-N-A-X. Yes. Um, I'm doing a live promotional thing tomorrow on Twitch. I sound mm -hmm. so techy. My God. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, I'm twitching tomorrow. Cool. Um, and, um, it was done radio play style with like a dozen actors at a time. So you talk about production costs. You have 12 people on the payroll plus the whole engineering people and everybody, but we're in a huge circle of microphones and we would do these lengthy scenes and people are acting and interacting. It was incredibly exciting to do. That is so Bug fun. snacks. Bug snacks. Please yeah. look it up. Let's yeah. talk about bug snacks actually. Um, so it, ju I mean, it just came out and I've been watching some of the things. It looks very interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about the game? I can tell you a little bit. A little that's, bit. That's yeah. Operative word there. Um, I'm going to be seeing a lot more of it tomorrow, right before the, the promo thing. Um, it is um, a game that is hilariously funny. So as much action as there is, um, they've really skewed it to comedy, funny characters. And to piggyback on what you said about the, the Spike thing, um, there, there are a lot of the characters have issues that get worked through. There's a very deep spirit of inclusion and, and real, real life stuff. There's a big LGBTQ component. I mean, it's, it's a very cool show. Yeah. And on top of that, it's hilarious. So I'm proud to be 
part of something that actually um, has not just comedic value and adventure and play game gameplay virtue, but um, I think I think audiences will think this is a really cool and and you know together and today kind of game. Yeah. So um, it's very funny. And who is your character? I play a guy called Chromedo Face, <laughs> and um, he uh, <laughs> at the risk of being redundant, he's he's sort of a New Yorky Danny DeVito, not miles and miles away from Spike, mm -hmm. but um, don't tell you know them that there might be a sequel to the game. Um, but uh, he's he's a little bit more you know uh, you know he's a little bit slurry this guy kind of guy, and he's like you know we got to get them little bug snacks, yeah, they're tasty little treats, and he's a so he's a little bit more he's got a different edge than than Spike. He's not as you know staccato and punchy that way. Yeah, not mean at all, but just has more eye rolly sarcastic than uh -huh. than gut punch mean. That's so funny. And so, w will you be posting on your Instagram the link to Twitch? I will. Okay. Now that you've said that, yes, that's <laughs> I on my to do list. Where's that to do list? Involved. Here it is. <laughs> I've got that to do list right. It's right there. Yep. I'm going to do that. You know, I'm you gonna... can also just take somebody's post and then just, you know, share it. <laughs> like, you like you, for instance. Yes. 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 Um, yeah. I also realized that. Um, I talked to them today about this event and they said, if they just Google the word bug snacks, um, there's a lot, there are many, many reviews that come up and probably we'll have a link to this event tomorrow. It's, it's being done by um, Epic, Epic, the people who do Fortnite okay. and it's going to be, uh, it's, it's a mobile thing, but they also do put it, rolling it out PS4, PS5. I'm so techie. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just, just saying all that stuff, you know? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Do, I mean, you're, you, so I know that you're not a super big social media user. How do you usually connect with your fans? You know, I'm really glad you brought that up. <laughs> tell me, tell me. Um, I have a love hate relationship with social media. I think like we all do. We all do. Um, and uh, I realize that the vigilance it requires to keep it so active um, in a lot of ways. And uh, it kind of takes me out of the game a little bit. So I love doing interviews. I love doing promotional events when someone says, be here at such and such a clock yeah. to take a picture of a head of cabbage or, or, you know, or whatever. I just, you know, you brought up earlier. The but nomination. it looks I... like Sting. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's this waffle that looks so, um, um, when I when I was fortunate enough uh, to get that nomination a couple of years ago, um, a dear friend said, "You know, you, you've got to like up your social media game, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be your guy, and we're gonna coach you through this, and I'm gonna get on Instagram." Ooh, and nice. um, so I did the Instagram thing, and he's like, "You got to post this many times and this often, and every time you're at a gig, you know, backgrounds." And it it was a little dizzying, and I remember saying and thinking and asking people who are very active on social media, do you now look at your world through the lens of this is a good angle or this is a good shot or, oh, look at this background. And, and it started to take me out of my life to think about what sharing that life could be. I'm getting deep here. Um, and I, and I got burnt out fairly quickly. Yeah. So, um, and that, and then some weird happened, something weird happened with my Instagram account, some unsavory things ended up there. So I just kind of walked away. You got yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. Maybe I did, but there were some people with less clothes than I would think would be on my Instagram account. Um, on and, your uh, account or on somehow your, something on maybe, your, I don't know how it, your timeline, like you were my following timeline. People? People probably my followers. I don't know okay. if they were bots or what they were doing. I don't okay. know. Okay. I all I, I know is. Got you. I all thought I know like, is, you were ended up on your timeline. <laughs> no. I, all I know is this, that it kind of burnt me out to the whole thing. I'm a poster child, the antithesis of the poster child for how to do it right. I'd rather, I'm so old school. I'd rather sit and chat with you. Yeah. I'd rather, you know, do interviews. And, and it, it, it scares me a little bit. And I don't want to go too far down this particular social dilemma. Is that the, the big the yeah. big movie that's out right now? Yeah. That, you know, I, I finally got an audition. And tell me if you've gotten one of these, where you submit your audition and your social media numbers. That's part of the thing you submit. And I'm like, 
aren't I being judged on the merit of my work? I mean, and by the way, I won't tell you what the name of the company was, but it was a massive national company. We all know it wasn't like we need your social media to get our word or our new product out there. Right. This was a massive company. I'm like, do you care if I have this many followers? Like, oh, suddenly when you start selling your product, you have a few more thousand people to to love it as well. It's it's a little scary to me. And yeah. um, uh, but I, I will probably reinvestigate using more social media as a tool. I just have to find a balance. And I will ask you, I'll throw this back at you. You do this show, you're very active as an actor, you do a lot of different things, you're a mom. Um, mm -hmm. How does social media fit into your the, the puzzle of your world? It's interesting. Um, I think when I first got on social media with like Friendster back in, I don't even know what year, I think I was probably in college, Friendster and then it was, you know, the internet was this cool, weird thing where cool, weird people hung out. And I loved it. <laughs> and uh, I moved, I, I was like, going into college, I said, I don't even want a computer. Like, ugh. and then I ended up on the digital culture floor with a bunch of tech nerds. And I was like, you guys are amazing. I love this. And I actually ended up majoring in new media. And um, wow. And so I, I was in many ways like an early adopter, but then last year i was trying to focus on writing a feature and i needed to carve out time for it and i was like wow. social media you gotta go um you're you are like the hand in my puppet like you are controlling <laughs> me in ways i can't always figure out like if i check it and then i have like general anxiety or so i i took a 14 month hardcore break getting off was wow. so easy it was just uh, you know, wow. I would occasionally be like, this is a beautiful moment. I should take a picture and like share it. And what would I, and then I'm like, no, nope, I'm going to keep this moment for myself. And it was a really nice wow. time. But after a certain period of time, I'm like, I feel like a digital nomad. And I very much feel called to bring people together and, um, and be, bring the light. And especially with COVID and everything, I, I decided to get back on in part because Again, I, I felt it had been so long that it's like if a job is booked in the woods and nobody tweets it, do they even yeah. know it exists? I'm like, am I, you know, I, what, is, what is going on with that? Um, so I got back on and, and this has been a nice way to actually connect and um, use my platform to elevate other people and share information that I think is useful. Um, but you are completely right that you do end up viewing your life through the lens of wow how would how would this be consumed instead of how is this experienced um yeah you know it's a catch-22 though <laughs> but i and i get it and i and i love um you know doing events and i and you yeah. do want to be very grateful for the fans that are supportive of your work and want more of it and they enjoy the game or the show or, or whatever so i do actually feel a responsibility weirdly i mean yeah. the fans make us you know and and without them our shows and things wouldn't perpetuate so i i would like to be there when people like find me and write to me and say oh can you write me a letter or can you send this or can you do a thing or um I, i'm always on board. I mean, I just am that grateful. I mean, I think that if, if you were to ask me what I'm most grateful for in this business, um, I, I would just say that I get to do what I love and that I still feel probably the biggest blessing is when that phone rings and I'm told I'm the one, I feel no different at my ripe old age than I did way at the beginning of the game. And, and I wish that on anybody that it's not like, Oh yeah. Okay. We'll fit it in if we can. Um, I'm so delighted, you know, to quote every commercial ever written. I know they have a choice and there are a bunch of guys just as talented. I feel incredibly lucky. <laughs> You're just saying that cause it's true. Um, but, um, but I, I do, I feel really lucky. Um, and mm -hmm. You know, I, I think my wife would tell me that I, 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 I lean on luck too much. That perseverance and and industriousness uh, certainly have had their place in my world. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, when when it comes to like Tom and Jerry, when they were first developing the show, they asked if I would do scratch track, mm -hmm. 
And I thought, well, that's a smart thing to do. You do some temp lines as they develop the scripts and try new scripts and throw out old scripts and get them all sort of ready. Um, mm. but he asked me to do that. And I would go out to Glendale and do the scratch. Yeah. And then the next week I would do more scratch thinking they'll get used to hearing me. <laughs> and I did that for about 18 months going out to Glendale and recording and recording in hopes that I would just keep putting my, my reel in the water. And 18 months later, when it was time to make the show, I was pretty dismayed to get an email from my agent as I get all my auditions, an invitation to audition to play Spike on Tom and Jerry, knowing by that email, it went to a bazillion people and I, I was crushed. And, uh, but Anyway, it worked out. I think that, you know, Warner Brothers thought, well, why don't we just use the guy that's been doing it all this time? Yeah. But perseverance, um, keeping your skill set sharp, studying, working hard is there. Um, being grateful, all that good stuff. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you wear a lot of hats. I mean, in addition to being an amazing voice actor, <laughs> you are a casting director and a yeah. voice director. Um, I know you directed the series Get Blake because I yes. was in the pilot. <laughs> Although sadly, my character, oh, bye bye, Jinx, my character got written out. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that that was a really fun was, show fun. to to direct. Um, we did fifty two episodes. It was a Nickelodeon show, and at that time, there was kind of a shake up at Nickelodeon, and it kind of didn't come back. And it sort of was a head scratcher. Everybody on it knew it was a funny show. I'm sure you can still find you know videos of them on Amazon or elsewhere. Um, really funny show. Really just a, a terrific, yeah. silly, oddball, quirky show. Um, How did and you I get was... started voice directing? Well, it's interesting on that particular show. Um, our mutual friend, Eric, from the Mr. Men show, um, was living in France and uh, running a, a company there, an animation company. And he reached out and said, would you want to audition for the show? And I said, yes. And then he said, would you be interested in directing the show? And I said, yes. That was the interview process. Uh, I wish life was always that easy. I ended up just being handed that show and one of the, oh. one of the leads in the show to, to do for all those episodes. Um, my real directors, and this is actually a short anecdote I do like to say, um, because I had been doing television and film, and I come from New York theater. You and I are both theater folk, I think. You're a theater person, aren't you? Plays? Uh, yes, I haven't done a play in a long time, but it's cut from the It's music. It's in there. Yeah, it's you in went there. to Emerson, you did theater. Mm -hmm. um, so I went right to New York and did theater for 10 years, mm -hmm. and I, I was just a theater guy. And um, when I came out to L.A., it was to do, you know, a lot more film and TV. Voiceovers was always the sort of side thing I did. And I waffled in it and did mostly commercials and things. But um, I was hired to cast an anime show, a Gundam anime show. And what, in those days, we had... Were about? Was this was, when you were in New York? This was here. This was here. here. Okay. It was, it was yeah. And um, in those days, they had live auditions. Now, boys and girls, a live audition is when you drive to a place, you pay for parking, you sit in a lobby until it's your turn to go in. You walk into a room where people scowl at you, you try to be funny, and then you go back to your car, hoping you didn't get a ticket and hoping you got the job. <laughs> but now we do auditions <laughs> from home. We record everything here. We send it in. And um, it's a completely different, different thing. So I was hired to cast this cartoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was sitting there watching actor after actor come in and the producers were in there with me. And they said, you know, we really like the way you're directing these actors and getting these reads out of them. Their take two and take threes are unbelievable. Would you please submit your resume to direct this show? I said, absolutely. Hold on one second, please. Let me just, there you go. And I handed them a, a blank piece of paper. I said, Here, here's my resume. Oh, let me just write my name on it. Here's my phone number. I was just being cute because there's no way I'm getting that job. And, um, and I got the job. You know, they, they, wow. liked, they saw I was dealing with the actors well and able to communicate what I think the essence of the scene or the line was about. And I think that's what they needed from a director. So, that's so funny. Um, sometimes Jeff it's not about this, experience. Yeah, so Jeff on this thread was just saying that he's in one of the new Gundam shows, which is pretty ironic. Ah, uh, nice. Love that. Mm -hmm. Welcome sorry, to the Gundam family there, sir. 
sorry to interrupt your train so, of thought, but yeah. So, no, that was my that was my first job. We did um, a hundred and four two full seasons of it, one hundred and four episodes. Mm -hmm. I was the sole director. I sat in that room for a very very long time, and because of that. Um, some producers from Sony asked me to direct uh, a feature, which was the biggest budget thing I've ever worked on in my still to date. Um, there is a famous, uh, your, your fans will know about Otomo, who made the masterpiece Akira, uh, the first, the first uh, anime to ever win an Oscar back in the day. And this was his new movie. It was called Steam Boy. And it was sort of steampunk, very, you know, fun action kind of stuff. And cool. In anime, it's fairly, um, um, and it, it, they they said you can cast whoever you want, and I said, well, no, I mean it's anime. They said no, but it's Otomo. I said, well, I want the grandpa to be Sir Patrick Stewart, and they said, okay, but he's in London. You'd have to fly there to direct him. I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> and I said, um, and for his son, I'd like Alfred Molina but he's playing Tevia on Broadway right now. Well, you'd have to go stay in New York for a couple of weeks. Would that be okay? I'm like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it was kind of crazy. And uh, my third role, I, I wanted to use Anna Paquin, who was here shooting a show in LA. So I, I, they just kind of, I spent a year flying around directing people. It was crazy for an anime movie. It's a fantastic, I think a very, very underrated movie. I'd be very curious to see if some of your podcast friends here, our, our, our Instagram TV friends have ever seen Steam Boy. I know a lot of purists like to hear it in the original Japanese, um, but this dub is so strong. The acting is so great. I urge you to maybe play with it and watch it in both languages, Steam Boy, really kind of an underrated movie i think okay wonderland viewers we have homework this week <laughs> yeah huh? did you did you have any characters in that as well i played the only non-british character it's it's they wanted like that it's a britishy kind of movie mm -hmm. um takes place in manchester and um but there is one nice role that they asked me to play uh which was just a blast so i got to do that you know the only the only americano and just said you had Kari was in it, Kari Walger. Yes, Kari was in it. Oh, we're looking things up. Yes, Kari, <laughs> and uh, great. It was a great cast. I mean, even all the other characters were populated by real stalwart people, if not you know famous celebrities. All amazing actors, just some fantastic people. Wow, that's amazing. And so, yeah, you they... also speaking of Oscars. You not you directed the Chub Chubs, which was the Oscar <laughs> winner for best animated short film. Um, the Chub Chubs. Um, it's very funny. Um, a student of mine. I teach voiceover. If anybody ever needs to know that, yes. um, I had a student. That, <laughs> that doesn't matter. But I had a student who had this side gig working at Sony ImageWorks doing special effects. And she, um, to be very clear, I did not direct it, but I did cast direct it. Okay. Um, okay. And um, so they were doing this, her team was doing the short video, the short film, and they asked me if I would cast the thing. I said, sure, I will, you know. And we held uh, all kinds of auditions, and we did this, we did this, we got it mostly populated, but there's one character that they couldn't, you know, do. And I said, I don't know why it's so hard. I can't find someone just to do, bup, 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 bup. and they said, you're going to play that role. <laughs> So I ended up playing four different voices in this thing, little ancillary characters. It's a really adorable little short. It did win the Oscar. I don't get a statue, but I get to talk about it here with you. Um, it was just kind of funny because it was this little little side hustle thing at, at, a, at a video effects company. And there wasn't a big budget. We didn't really pay much for the actors or the casting director. Um, <laughs> and uh, we just did it. And the next thing you know, my student is on stage getting an Oscar. It was very, very exciting. Wow. And what year was that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I should probably know that. A lot of years ago, in the early <laughs> 2000s, aughts, I guess people can look aughts. it up. Yeah, them. early aughts. Um, um, so, yeah, you mentioned that you also are a voice acting coach, and I know you do classes. How has um, COVID shifted um, that line of work for you? It has shifted it, you know, um, I've always loved teaching. Um, in another interview someday, we'll talk about the fact that I'm actually a math guy. I used to teach math as my side job when I lived in New York as a stage actor. I was a math tutor for like calculus. Yeah, 
those brain cells are gone. Uh, but I had them once upon a time. And I've always loved teaching. It's just something that makes me it's just very rewarding. Uh, it's one of the best parts of being a dad. Um, and I was that guy that was a camp counselor. I just loved working with people and teaching. And I started coaching actors more and more in New York and then here on mostly theatrical stuff, pilot season. I was very busy helping people prepare for auditions. And when I got more and more active uh, doing voiceovers, people would want me to give them sort of ongoing lessons. And it wasn't really a master plan. And suddenly I was doing so many of those. I said, I got to package you all into a single room and teach a class. And so this sort of idea of becoming a voiceover teacher mushroomed not out of a deep passion to be a voiceover teacher, but just a, it was this organic journey. Boy, has that been unbelievably rewarding. I've done it for 25 years. Um, and COVID has changed it only in that now I do it on Zoom. And now I can coach people out of LA. Those are calls I can't take. I do phone coaching. I do phone one-on-ones or Skypes. But now I can include those people in a group class where it's, you know, it's the Brady Bunch. It's the, it's the, it's the big, you know, grid of people. <laughs> But it works really well. Some people may opt when it's their turn to read to turn their video camera off so they can just feel like they're in a little cocoon like we are when we're in a booth. Um, but it's just as rewarding, just as much fun. I wasn't sure about it when this first happened. So I, I said yes to be a guest, like one night voiceover guide to other people's classes to see how I could do this whole thing. And I realized... Um, it can be done very well. I'm having a blast doing it. I try to teach at least three times a year if I can. Uh, do you have any classes?